So it's going to be me here, Peter Bormann and Peter Auersand from, from RKPP, who's going to present this. But really, this was a, a very strong joint effort um, with Peter Dishington from the NPD, Fahad Dilip from Equinor and Surrender Manral from Slumberger. And so we're going to show you the, the results of and the summary of what we have done there and how we have done it and, and what would we then do different if we would ever do it again. Um, we had a, a large crowd of people who sponsored us for this event, and that was really necessary. I, I, I share because this is force. I wanted to also share a little bit of the financials that we had here to to really show that we put this money to good use, that we got there, and that we that we were very grateful for all that sponsoring that we got. So with this, I go to the next slide. So first of all, you may ask yourself, well, why on earth are you guys doing this? And the reason, the reason why I had that sort of in my back pocket, I always wanted to run such a competition on biological data, um, is the very successful SEG machine learning contest in 2016 that was run by Matt Hall and Brandon Hall from, from Canada and, and the US respective. And that was really the inception of a community of geoscience uh, data analysts that for the first time, you know, um, there was an open data set and somebody said like, hey, what if we do a machine learning competition to predict lithofascies? There were 40 teams at the time, at the, at the time signed up, eight wells, and, and it turned out that the well data is not truly public and uh, it's terribly biased. And yet, you know, it got 136 citations in Google Scholar in only four years. And, and so what that shows, there's a huge explosion of data geoscientists after that time, um, I mean, that's for example, Earth Science Analytics company here, here in Norway. They were the, they became third or something in that competition there, and and I learned about them, and we started to collaborate with them. So so this was a sort of inception of of this sort of I'd say machine learning revolution in oil and gas. And what it really demonstrated is that there's a need for more open data. We should be able to put more of these sort of competition data sets out there, so universities companies, etc., can try their tools and work with this. And uh, as I say, it also demonstrated that there's a sort of a growing community and increasing still skill pool of what I call geodata scientists. So these are geologists, geophysicists and other geos that that are a little bit more computer able than, for example, me. So so then we, you know, I said, I called up Lynn one day, Lynn from Forest, and said, I'd like to do that, but it's it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a little bit untraditional to what we normally do. And and she said, yeah, yeah we are happy as a, as a force organization to support that and, and go find yourself an organ, a team that helps. So we put a team, we put a poll out there and ask who would want to be part of organizing this. And, and so uh, Surrender from Slambache and Fahad from Equinor and Peter from the NPD and Peter, Peter Hauerson from RKPP. We got together. It was the beginning of the pandemic times. We never actually met in person through the entire event and uh, forged out how we want to do this. And we set ourselves some very clear goals. Um, it has to be a global competition. It has to be online and it has to be free of charge for the participants. We also said the data needs to be completely open source. The codes on the Velog stuff needs to be open source. And we wanted to provide this sort of a much better legacy database that other people could use to test machine learning models on their logs. Um, we also and this wanted to see how far the technology has progressed in uh, seismic data um, fault recognition. And that was largely sort of I, I really was interested in that and um, and so we found we split the competition said we're going to make a velo competition and we make a, a fault prediction competitions and fault prediction competition we didn't want to see any codes or something we just wanted to know roughly how people got to their results yeah so and then you go like oh yeah that sounds all nice and we had a plan and then you need a data set and and that's of course you know whoever is a geologist always or geophysicist knows that the data set is the biggest pain. And so we we of course here in Norway are extremely fortunate that we have the well data set public after two years and from it's a Norwegian open government license so it's a super permissive license you can use it simply can't sell it. 
and they looked ah oh, okay, but they're not perfect as you all aware. So so we in fact actually spend quite a bit of time. Um, <laughs> mute your phones, please, if you're not talking. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time cleaning up the data and making sure it's consistent. And uh, we got the Veltops from the NPD, but then we needed that lithology data set. So we could have gone to the vendors there, as you are aware, there are vendors who sell you lithology data. And I reviewed some of that data and we actually thought it's not consistent enough to do a competition on it. So we uh, we decided and come back in the later slide that we're going to use make our own lithology data. And so we got funding to do that 200,000 Krona from force. Thank you very much, dear force. And uh, we supplemented that by 260,000 Krona from sponsors. Now, you may all remember when I went out uh, and asked for sponsoring money from people and Fahad did most of that, actually. Uh, the oil price was negative for a short period of time. So you, you try go ask an oil company to give you some sponsoring when the oil price is negative, it's not good timing. But anyway, we still got quite a few people who supported us and so we did that. So apart from the data set, we also needed a sort of a public platform where you can score that data like these submissions, right? When people do these models and they test it against your data, we needed some scoring platform. And, and there we got help from Matt Hall and Agile through this company Xeek. That's a sort of a shell spin off. And they said, we are very, we're, you're welcome. We're hosting your the competition for you, but you have to sign like a 55 page legal document to do so. And that was the moment when it was very close that we actually had to stop the whole competition. Um, you know, once you're faced with these sort of things and, and, and luckily Matt Hall here, you know, talked some sense into them and um, into the parent company here. And we got that deal pretty much signed in the last minute and all of a sudden in the beginning of July, we're good to go with this competition and, and the world looked rosy again. So that was, uh, it was sort of a moment of tension. So then we come to the uh, lithology data set. Every, all of you who looks at lithology data sets knows that there is no truth. And so what we what we sort of, and, and there's, it's sort of hard to make these definitions between a sandstone and a sandstone shale and a shale and a marl. And, and you know, of course, anybody can tell a halide from a sandstone, but where do you put the, these boundaries? So we got, uh, we asked around who could help us here. We had a certain couple of ideas, went down a couple of leads, but in the end, Explo crowd here proved to be of extreme value to us and saying, hey, we're having a lull in the, in the working, the oil price is low. We can do this for you for a reasonable price. And I was super happy with how the, the, uh, the sort of collaboration went with them. We had a couple of meetings and they really took this and did this on their own. Um, essentially, we paid them 250,000 NOx for the for the well log for the preparing the lithology and that's about 2,400 yeah, something wells. It was about 2,200 knock per well, which is a, a good price. And then one day I get a phone call from a guy in, in, in Vietnam. They are having this uh, machine learning platform there for well logs. It's a sort of really nice cloud based software. And they said, hey, Peter, we want to be part of this. How can we support you? I said, well, well, make me some lithology data. And they said, yeah, it's no problem, right? And two weeks later, they they came around and supplied us with uh, with some 14 wells for lithology data, uh, very nicely hand interpreted, and um, and uh, as uh, in return for becoming a sponsor and offering free logins to the software and popularizing that. So that that was really nice. We also uh, managed to give ExproCrowd access to some of the ConocoPhillips in-house lithology interpretation just to speed up the process and that, that proved to be very valuable. So then what did we get in the end? We got 98 wells that we had in uh, totally we had 118 wells with lithology data interpreted. We released to the public 98 wells with the lithology data that you see here, all the logs and the lithology data. We released 10 wells where we just released the logs, but not the lithology data. And we had 10 wells that we didn't show anybody and didn't tell anybody um, where these wells are. Um, 
And, and so obviously, so we wanted to test these algorithms against the blind data set, something that have, has never been seen by the competition, which is, of course, in, incredibly important, right? Because otherwise, everybody can make a model these days that fits the data that you have seen perfectly. But making a model that generalizes to data that was not in the, in the initial training data set is the sort of real, real uh, key. We got a lithology interpretation, which you see here. And we know that this is subjective, but we were hoping for a subjective bias in there. And we also asked for a confidence interpretation. So we made a confidence score and say like, you know, if you're really confident that this is a shale, the mudlock sets a shale, the cuttings look like a shale, it's a shale. So you give this confidence one. For example, here in the Balder, you know, if it's a volcanic stuff and it's it's sort of hard to decide what is this actually? Is this tough? Is it shale? Is it sandstone and tough? Then it's maybe not so easy to be 100% certain of your lithology interpretation. We gave that a three. And Explo Crowd did that. Uh, and I, I just have to say it again you know, if you want to get this done, ask them. I mean, they did it expertly. So I'm very happy about that. And that saved us from force a lot of time in, in, in preparing the data set. But then, you know, as we all know, lithology is interpretation and who's right here. So here you see the Conoco Phillips in-house lithology interpretation of a bell. And here you see the Explo crowd interpretation and the same here. Now there are certain things like if we focus on that well here on the left at the moment, where it's simply mm, semantics, right? This petrophysicist here is a little bit more on the sandy side of things, had a good sandy day, right? And, and that person here is a bit more, ah, this is more shaly than sand. That's really a boundary cutoff. But then you could also come across things like that, where the Conoco Phillips guy says that's a limestone and the Explo crowd guy says it's a sandstone. So there is something where you really have to go back and look at the logs and, and, and find out who's right. And, and um, maybe, you know, here there was no, maybe we were not interested in the chalks of us, this didn't matter, we were interested down here where they agree. So, 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 you know, how do you do that? So now we get this uh, NOROC cutting images all as an industry, which are fantastic data set, but they don't have the vertical resolution sometimes to resolve these sort of issues or the, what is actually sand and shale. And so we were thinking here in the organizing community, maybe one has to crowdsource these lithology interpretation. Maybe the weighted average mean of 20 petrophysicists is actually the truth. And, and I just want to highlight here, I'm sorry for crossing out the beautiful cat and the dog here. It's, you know, when you see things that Google does with image recognition or, you know, this is or your, your phone or even Microsoft Office these days tags your images, your seismic images and puts uh, AI text on it. That's a sort of a simple binary problem, right? It's a cat or a dog or it's a, a garden or a blanket or what have you not. In Earth sciences, because of the lack of information and the lack of resolution, we don't have these binary classifications very often. So it's actually a much harder problem to create training data. And that resonates all the way through these competitions. On the seismic side, we provided two data sets from Australia, uh, one for training and one blind data set. Why Australia? Australia has a super permissive open source seismic library, uh, much more open source than the Norwegian library. And, um, and that's what, why we use it. In addition, Equinor here, gave us a synthetic model where they, they provided a, a reflectivity model and the true fault location model. And there was quite a bit of effort and a very nice model. And they said, here you go, it's all public source. And, you know, that sort of shows how the industry is changing. Also, Slumbershade did the same. They had some pre-existing models for making fault uh, planes and, and ground true for fault planes and said, you know, you can have this for free. And, and that sort of to me, it's sort of, you know, three, four years ago, you would have gone to an oil company and said, can you give me something I can make public? I don't think you would have gone very far. And, and now we're seeing that, that actually, you know, operators and vendors alike are realizing that, that there is value in putting open data out there and, and having people more than our sort of uh, internal minds look at this data and work their data. 
So that was the seismic data. It looks okay, you know, in the end of the day, I thought that I get something like that out. I mean, obviously here are some PowerPoint faults, uh, you can kill me for that, but uh, there we go. So who participated? So in the end, we had about 400 teams, maybe a thousand or even more individuals that signed up for this competition on this Seek platform. I don't have anything more than their emails typically, so that's GDPR, I didn't want to know anymore, but so, Afterwards, I asked a couple of them where they're from, and so it, there was a really large contingent from Brazil who somehow slipped off the map here. Sorry, I put them into Chile now. Um, so there's a university in, in, in Macaé, and then uh, some guys in Rio, and then we had Politecnico from Milano was a big group. We had Ola Vale who won the Velo competition from Nigeria, sort of a lonely undergraduate wolf who got into machine learning only a couple of, um, essentially a year ago. Then we had the guys from Equinor here in Norway, but unfortunately, and I think that's a real, real wake up call maybe also for the Norwegian universities, no participation at all from any university in Norway. That's I thought was a little bit sad, you know, given that we have such an excellent research base here and so much free data. So that's maybe something that, that hopefully will change in the future. So this is the people who participated. Um, there was a little bit of discussions on Swang and, and the Xeek forum about asking questions, but it was mostly people working for themselves. There's a lovely story. There was a guy in Australia who, who recently got into machine learning and used this project to educate on himself. There were some university students from somewhere in Eastern Indonesia who got hold of the seismic competition and won it in the end. So there's uh, it, it sort of, I enjoy that. I thought that was fantastic that we little group here in Norway managed to get a global attraction through word by mouth on LinkedIn. And, and it just goes to show how beautifully connected the world is these days. So with this, I stop rambling and Peter will take over. Peter, are you there? Sure, yes. Yeah? So, uh, I mean, we had to, to uh, think about this a little bit carefully when we made this training data set. For example, uh, a common problem when when uh, when making these uh, machine learning competitions is that you make the training data too artificial. It doesn't look like real data. And, and that means that the competition will be fine. I mean, there will be a winner of the competition and uh, you will learn something, but uh, the methods you apply won't necessarily work in the wild. So it will sort of be like an artificial setting. So, so we made sure that the data we published for this public uh, for this competition was as as realistic as practically possible i mean uh, that means a, at least a couple of things i mean uh, like real well logs the well logs we um, put out there had missing sections like any any well logs do in a, in a realistic uh, manner meaning that uh, the participants had to handle this problem uh, which is actually a kind of a non-trivial thing in, in machine learning because machine learning algorithms have access to, um, uh, usually have access to all the features. Uh, another, uh, you're switching between your email. No, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to switch it off. Yep, uh, another, um, uh, another aspect that we kept realistic is also the um, uh, lithology impal imbalance. Uh, more than half of the, uh, found lithology in our data set is, is shale, which is uh, more or less uh, uh, realistic given the area we're after. And that's also something that the competitors had to handle, right? It's very easy to make a good shale predictor, but if you're going to pick up these more uncommon lithologies, you have to make sure you, uh, you design your algorithms in a clever way. Another issue with competitions, I think, is that sometimes what uh, is uh, is scored as the best solution is necessarily what an expert or a domain expert would consider a, a good solution. In our case, um, we, we wanted to try to avoid that the winner of uh, of the competition, like numerically speaking, wasn't necessarily what a petrophysicist would consider a good solution to the interpretation problem. Uh, and and we, we did this by uh, uh, in introducing this uh, this penalty matrix where we actually penalize certain errors more than others. So uh, mistaking a dolomite for sandstone shale would be penalized much more than uh, 
um, penalizing sandstone shale from sandstone, for example. We can go to the next slide. Yep. Um, we also had this leaderboard so that um, all the, the, the participants could submit weekly um, uh, models and be scored on, on uh, a, a hidden a hidden uh, lithology interpretation on the test data set. And then you could see here uh, as a function of time, the teams improving uh, up until the end of the competition. And at the end of the competition, we invited the top 30 teams to submit uh, their codes so we can run them on a truly hidden data set for the final scoring. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, how did it go? I mean, the, the results were extremely close. Um, so close that I think the uh, actual wells that went into the hidden data set, probably the, the sort of the random choice of what wells we included in the hidden data set, probably ended up um, deciding the winner. Um, because I think a different subset of, uh, of blind test wells might have actually um, uh, changed the score sufficiently that this, this uh, uh, final leaderboard would actually change a bit, but but it also means that probably these teams started getting close to the limit of how well you could recreate this human interpretation. You get the, there's this, always a certain uncertainty in in the subjectivity of the interpretation, and getting a 100% recreation of a human interpretation is impossible um, because then you have to be inside of the subjective mind of the interpreter. Um, so, in my mind, this also means that the teams were probably pushing the boundaries. At the end of the day, they had 80% accuracy, meaning that in 80% of the time their labels agreed with the human label. And they're pushing the boundary of how close you can get to uh, such a subjective interpretation. Um, next slide, please. Um, sort of on the machine learning side, the uh, winning recipes seem to follow a certain pattern. Uh, if you look at the top three competitors, they used uh, an algorithm uh, called uh, boosted uh, trees or gradient boosting. Um, not rocket science. It's a pretty standard method that's pretty robust for these kinds of problems. Uh, it also happens to be the um, algorithm that was successfully used in the previous competition Petri was referring to. Um, and the winning team seemed to uh, put a lot of effort in avoiding overfitting using cross-validation. Um, they uh, had some decent pre-processing, and I think that's uh, a lot of the distinguishing factor between the winning and the, the winning teams and the teams further down the list was having uh, good pre-processing, dropping rare curves, deciding which uh, logs to use, imputing missing logs where they needed to be imputed, and normalizing it in a way that made sense for uh, for the physical logs you were looking at. Um, it also added non-local features so that you look at not only you look at the log the way a human might look at the log, that you look at it relative to the log near it. So you introduce non-local features. You see if you're uh, actually uh, having a peak or a or a, or a, how you are in in terms of local. And the local behavior of the logs you're looking at. And next slide, please. And then just uh, uh, finally, as part of this, uh, you could see here the um, confusion matrices for the top four teams. And uh, and overall, uh, uh, the top teams are pretty good at distinguishing shale and sandstone, which is uh, what you should expect. But also, uh, you are also able to catch the more Rare lithologies in uh, 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 pretty, I think, a pretty decent number of the cases. Um, but um, the way this thing was scored, you definitely um, get rewarded a lot for getting the the shale sandstone dis distinction correct, and that's perhaps something we would uh, tweak if we were to do this again to reward more um, getting the the more difficult lithologies right. Yeah. Okay, um, so now we talked about the setup. I guess some of you are interested, how does this actually look like? So here is the force interpretation. 
And these are the machine interpretations of Olavale, the person who won it, the GIA team in, in Brazil and the ICA team also in Brazil. So these are the top three by score. And always to the right of it, you see red is when the prediction is wrong. And when you look at that, you think like, oh, Jesus Christ, there was a lot of wrongness here, right? This is wrong, this is this is all always wrong. And 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 that was my first thought. Actually, it was a lot more wrong before because I had a label colored the wrong way, but now it's right. So so but what's the point here is that you see is where where these models often are wrong, is where the interpretation is rather subjective sometimes. Like for example, you know, in these sort of shale sand mixtures. That's where where it's sort of hard, it, and this is this is where, where what Peter uh, Peter alluded to is this sort of what is actually the true lithology there is sort of a little bit of a, 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 an issue, right? So who's actually right? Is the model right or is the label right? Um, there's also interesting things. For example, here we had a well that this was the lithology label we got from uh, from Expro Crowd. And none of the models agreed with it. All the models said it's either shale or a sandstone. So I went back to the cuttings and looked what it really is. And it turns out that it is some sort of sandy conglomerate kind of stuff. There's actually a core through it. Um, and and that's, that's, I thought that's a really interesting use case of um, machine learning, because if all the models disagree with your label, go back and check your label. You know, I, I'm not going to blame anybody for that. We all make mistakes, right? So, you know, sometimes you do have a bad day and you call something a limestone and, and you know, they had, had a lot of time pressure. So it happens. But this sort of, this is where, where I think this sort of machine assistant workflow that we're going to have in the future is going to be really valuable is that, you know, it highlights areas where the user, the intelligent human being should go in and say like, oh, well, let me check this. Maybe I learned something here. We also had situations like that on this well where essentially it's called chalk and all the models say is limestone. Well, should I blame a machine learning model for that? No, because chalk is essentially limestone. Um, here, once again, we have this sort of, there you can see how the models actually differ in, in between each other. So the first two here are relatively shaly, just as the, as the label, and then one of them switches over to sandstone. So these are fine, fine cutoffs. None of the models, and that's a little bit disappointing, look, took care of these sort of thin beds. Uh, that's an easy fix, right? If you see the density going, spiking over like that, you could have hard coded that. But so, because of our penalty or our scoring matrix, and because these things are volumetrically insignificant, it, it didn't come out of in the competition. And that's somewhere where the sort of petrophysicist with a machine learning model would, of course, handle very different than in a competition setting. Here's some more wells. Just to run it through, I mean, you know, look at a right wrong score. This is a good prediction here. I think this is getting pretty close. I mean, I'd be, you know, if you don't, if you go from having nothing on a well uh, to going this here to the automatic predicted, it's actually okay. You know, the salts are often found dry, the limestones, etc. It's it's these sort of mixed classes that create predict, uh, create problems. One, some more. I mean, I just I'm not going to talk about it. You you make up your own mind now. Um, yeah, I think this is okay. Okay, how did it go with the fault competition? It didn't go well at all. Let's put it like that. And the, it's sort of interesting. It's a good lesson learned here. Um, 80 teams signed up. Seven, only seven submitted the result, and none of the vendors who go around and sell this uh, fault prediction stuff at various prices, from extremely cheap to extremely overpriced. Um, submitted anything to the benchmark because this is clearly an area where there's still too much IP, uh, intellectual property rights out there. There's not open source yet, not open source enough yet that people are willing to share their models and say, I have this fault recognition model. So in the end, the people from Spavion, they won with their model because it actually did catch these sort of large fussy faults in the blind data set here, uh, uh, sorry, uh, relatively well, but it's not something that you'd go, hey, super fantastic about. I just put an image of our in-house ConocoPhillips model about it, and actually I think this is on par with a lot of what a lot of the vendors have out there. So, so here this sort of crowdsourcing, open sourcing of uh, machine learning models for fault prediction didn't work. 
Um, I leave it at that. It's not impressive. Let's put it like that. Um, so, Peter, you take over here. Sure. I mean, uh, just to summarize, I, I really want I really want to emphasize that open data sets are key uh, to further developing ML in a field of expertise. I mean, uh, uh, some of the famous open data sets like uh, ImageNet really pushed the technology uh, like leaps forward in just a couple of years after these data sets have been uh, published. And I, I think the same uh, is true and will be true for uh, for geoscience. It also as oil companies or people who might buy these services for, to use on our data, it, it actually provides a common benchmark. And uh, so that uh, if someone comes along with a, a really good lithology, what they claim to be a really good lithology predictor, it's uh, it's tempting to and then to ask them uh, how well do you perform on the force data set, and the force data set uh, for lithology prediction is actually the biggest open data set of its kind by an order of magnitude. Um, and I also like the fact that it democratizes ML on subsurface data. I mean, it means that. This isn't just something that uh, can be done in the companies that have all the data. You actually can harvest a lot of the creativity and and ingenuity uh, from students, independents, and others to actually uh, work on uh, on subsurface data analytics on equal footing. Um, yeah, of course, uh, uh, we have learned a lot doing this, and we wouldn't do everything in the same way if we were to do this again. Um, I think we, we we knew this beforehand, but uh, this competition only emphasized that scoring needs to be consistent with a petrophysicist's evaluation. I mean, uh, uh, we can't have a, a setup where the, um, the winning team is not necessarily close to the what would be considered the best interpretation. Uh, we need to find a way to to make these uh, somewhat consistent with each other. They always, they will never agree perfectly, but this is important but both for the credibility of the competition, but also for, um, I mean, the end goal is to actually develop methods that can be used on real data and used in a way we want to use uh, lithology interpretation. And also, I, I think we, 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 we want to emphasize that we learned that the true legacy is the data set. So we, I think it makes sense to invest in the data set and keep prices largely largely symbolic because at the end of the day the competition is over you have a lot of engagement you have a lot of solutions out there uh, but but the data set also lives on and it will stay uh, a benchmark for the foreseeable future for these kinds of applications uh, and, and like Peter mentioned, uh, the fault competition was not a uh, success. Um, and, and we really need to reevaluate like its purpose and how we set it up to fulfill that purpose. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to do something like that uh, as a competition. Yeah, so if this, uh, thanks a lot for uh, for the for the sponsors, you know, this this was great fun, very hard work from the organization team. I'm happy we managed to pull it off. The Velo competition went fantastic. The seismic competition didn't go so well, and you know that's just part of of experimentation. Sometimes you win it, sometimes you lose it, and overall, I'm 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 happy with the results. So um, um, Let's see if there are some questions in the audience. Does anybody have anything or would like to see more or, or criticize constructively? We are very open to all of that. There we go. Nobody? Oh, there's lots of questions. No. Oh, there's a transcript. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. So, nobody? Well, then. There is one uh, one question. Oh, okay. Why do I not see that? Uh, who's... Peter, can you maybe just read it out? I don't see it on my screen, that question. Um, so there's a question. Hi, thanks for sharing those insights. Regarding the seismic part of the contest, do you think that requirements such as 
processing capacity and the use of other software for visualization influence the number of participants submitting results? Uh, I, I don't really think so because we got them, everybody who wanted to be part of the competition got a free full module license from Open Detect, a soft, seismic analysis software company in, in the Netherlands. And the compute on these sort of three to five gigabyte seismic data sets is not too heavy. You can do that on a Google Colab. 